Hello, I'm Steph from My Driver Classic and recently we took out a Triumph 1500 and all throughout the video I made reference to the ADA 16. Now I got quite a few emails saying, Steph, can we revisit the ADA 16? And look, I'll always do my best for you a lot at home. And so here we are. We're testing here today an MG 1100. Now this is an absolutely gorgeous example very well cared for it's had an awful lot of money spent on it and it's a brilliant example to take you out and celebrate one of the best-selling cars of the 1960s and a personal favorite of mine as well so in today's video we're going to have a look around the car you can get up close and personal with a car which won so many hearts and minds across the world and we're even going to talk about that hydroelastic suspension because i know for some people it can seem like witchcraft or a little bit strange but today we're going to demystify it all and then we're going to finish off with a test drive so come on let's kick off and i'll talk to you about the ado 16. what do you get when you combine a man with genius Alicus Agonis with the learnings from the Mini and the stylings of Pininfarina. Well, in today's video, it's the ADO 16. The car came into a world wanting more. The Mini was a brilliant car, but it wasn't going to make the dealerships money, and that was so important for everything to work for BMC. The dealerships needed a car which gave them greater returns on sale and filled a gap which had been held by the beloved Morris Minor and A35. And just to be clear, they were very much still on sale at the time, because confusing but they were aging rapidly in a world where every other manufacturer was moving quite quickly so really that car was coming in to bring a more modern edge for that discerning buyer now remember Itagonis was riding on a high at BMC he had various successes like the Morris Minor and the Mini under his belt and so they pretty much said to him just crack on and with that he devised the first iteration of the ADO 16, which took the fundamentals of the Mini and stretched them to create a new car for the swinging 60s. The car, which had the same engine and gearbox, was then given a bit of a rejig and styling from Pininfarina. Now, it is worth noting that this relationship between the Pininfarina styling house and BMC wasn't a new thing, because, of course, for those of you that are BMC fans, you'll know that they'd previously worked on the A40. The car was then fitted with this is a prototype stage by the way the 948 version of the a series engine now realistically this wouldn't have been very suitable for a 60s car of this size it would have been slow and cumbersome and really wouldn't have matched up to the competition which guess what it's exactly what they found on the initial tests which meant that instead of doing some of the stuff that they do in the 70s which is where they rush and they make silly mistakes that they don't need to they actually say hold up we're going to take some time and get this right and with that they step the engine up from 948 to 1098 cc this is then combined with a new cylinder head which had larger inlet valves which then took the power from 37 brake horsepower up to a marginally impressive 48 brake horsepower. However, this wasn't the only change to the initial prototype, and they also fitted the hydroelastic suspension, the first vehicle to use this new setup. It required a bit of tinkering to get it just right, and it was the rubber in the suspension linkage which got rid of those early teething problems. So far, so good. You've got a great car which is going to be a big hit with the public, it's very modern, but what about the aforementioned dealers? Well, by this point, BMC had a fair few brands under their belt, and with that, a fair few dealers, and they need to keep everybody happy. In fact, we recently discussed some of these brand takeovers in the recent Riley video, and initially, the car, the ADO 16, was launched as the Morris, with BMC declaring at launch that every dealer in the world had an example. Again, very organised, streamlined approach, which they lose some of that steam in the 70s, but at this point, They've still got it. However, this is all very well and good, but what about the other BMC brands? Because dealerships need that representation. Brands have those people that have bought in, that are locked in on the brand loyalty. Well, this is where some of the finest 60s badge engineering comes into play. So the first example that follows the Morris is the MG1100, which is what we're testing here today. That comes out in 1962. The cylinder head was tweaked once again, and it took the car from 48 brake horsepower up to 55 brake horsepower. And by the way, if you're wondering, the demand was enormous. The car was a roaring success. And from there on in, various badge variants followed suit. And in 1967, you get the Mark II. And in 
1971, you get the Mark III. But by the end, they've had so many badge variants. You've got the overseas things, you've got the Incenti, everything. There's so much going on. You've got things like the Apache coming into play. But look, in short, the story of this car is rich, varied and exciting for what was simply at the time a means of getting from A to B. It gave people a way to travel in a reliable motor and for many taught them how to drive and it gave them their first taste of freedom. And that's not just in the UK, but worldwide. Now, there's an awful lot to say, so much, in fact, that I possibly couldn't cover it all in this video. I'd be sitting chatting to you for hours. And therefore, if you'd like to know more about the ADO 16 and the story and the variants and the wonderful things that happened worldwide because of this car, I recommend heading over to AR Online for further reading. Now, people always see cars like the Mini and the Morris Minor as the cars which shape Britain and with that change some of the world. But perhaps really it's the ADO 16 which deserves far more appreciation and credit for everything it put out there. Now come on, let's have a look at this dash. How can you not smile when you're in an ADO 16? They are beautiful vehicles and it's so easy to see why they won the hearts and minds of the buying public. Because bearing in mind, to set the scene for you, people were coming out of cars like the Austin A35, the Morris Minor, and they were coming into these. And it must have been like day and night because as someone who drives a Morris Minor all the time, I can't even begin to tell you what a modern step up this feels like. However, it is rather bizarre, isn't it, that they carried on selling the Morris Minor at the same time as the vehicle which replaced it. And did you know, my favourite geeky fact of the day is on record, I got this off AR Online, so it will be right because Keith's attention to detail is perfect. It's the only car where the vehicle replacing it didn't essentially replace it, they sold them at the same time. And the Morris Minor continued, I think in New Zealand, all the way through until 1972. So they clearly weren't done with that because they were still selling so many of these. However, production did scale back and I know that they cancelled the Morris Minor night shift to start making more of these because they were just so popular. And in fact, by 1967, when this particular example was sold, they'd reached a million units. And to say it came to market later on in 1962, it's quite a marvel to have reached that number so quickly. I believe it was the best-selling BMC vehicle of all time. It is just, really is just a marvellous little thing. However, it is worth noting that 1965 was the best year for sales and I think they held the market share in terms of just ADO 16s, not BMC, 14.3% of all new cars sold and it only lost its crown as the best seller to Ford in 1967 when it got overtaken by the Cortina. Now you might be thinking it's because it's slightly, maybe at this point slightly antiquated but actually a lot of people were put off by things like waiting, that's why a lot of people swapped over to Cortinas and for the larger engine of course. However, what have we got inside here? It's 1967, we're looking at our brand new MG1100 and the first things first is the glove box. Now as you'll be able to see here, it's quite stiff there, the magnet's very good, you have got an awful lot of space and I love a big glove box because it just helps keep a car neat and tidy because you can hide everything away in there, your tools and all your bits and pieces and you shut it up and it's gone. It just keeps that line very clean. You can tell that this is an Italian style vehicle. Now coming down from there, you have got your parcel shelf. Now you'll note that the cars that it replaces, like the Morris Minor, this isn't as deep as those, but to be honest, it's much better in the way it's molded around. The Morris Minor one can feel quite cumbersome in the way it juts out. And what I really like is this, is it called Terrazine, Tertrazine, that pattern that they sometimes have on shopping centre floor tiles from like the 60s and 70s, it's that same pattern, it's one of my favourite patterns. So for me that's quite a big win. And coming down from there you'll see you've got your heater controls. But again one of the things that really sells the ADO 16 for me is the way that everything 
is just curated and put together and it all feels very sophisticated, sleek, streamlined. It's not just shove this here, shove this there. This all just feels neatly tucked away and I really like that. Coming into the centre here, um, this is given a remarkable amount of prominence, the ashtray, which is ginormous and sits in the centre there and springs back into place. Again, a big step up from those metal ashtrays where it was became, you know, as soon as it's cold, hot, a little bit damp there, like ee, ee, ee. this with the spring loading, just again, a really great step forward into the future. You've also got your cigar lighter up there and coming in front of us here is one of my favorite dash layouts. I love this control panel here. So on this, which has just gently trimmed with a chrome finish, you've got your temperature gauge into the center there, you've got your speedo and over on the right hand side, you've got your fuel gauge. Now I'm gonna film it for you when we go out driving, but that's essentially an almost like a ticker tape which rises as you go up through your speeds. And I'm gonna try and show you that as we go along. It's one of my favorite design features on these. Over on the right hand side, you've got a mini control panel to your left here. You've got single speed wipers. Now for me, that's something that I think BMC should have really jumped on. By this point, I think they had that technology there to make twin speed wipers. They should have really put it into these to help it take that leap forward. Because by 1967, that's something that I think probably a lot of people were expecting, especially when they were looking at what the competition was doing. Over on the right hand side, you've got your side and headlights. You've got your choke. And just here, where you've got this little blanking plug, this is where your windscreen washer pump would have been. Now it would have been like when I showed you on the Morris Minor and it's like a push thing. I absolutely despise the little push things and somebody else must have as well because just down here it's been swapped over to an electric washer which trust me is one of the best little upgrades that you can do especially when you're driving and you've got your hand here, it's pumping here. No, just this is so much easier. Now in terms of what we're paired up with, we have got the four forward speed and reverse box on these and just a little bit like those boxes that were used on things like the Morris Minor, there's no synchro on first. Now this for me is another area where I think that BMC probably definitely had that technology could have got on top of it and could have put synchro on first. I know it would have been an additional cost. I know it would have been a slight change in all the development, but I just think things like that would have helped keep those sales really buoyant and just make it a much stronger competitor for some of the other saloons that were out there at the time. Now we've got the 1098 engine in this. We talked about that cylinder head and the changes that were made, taking it from 48 brake horsepower up to 55. But what's it sound like? There must be more play in my gearbox, by the way, because I swear that when I'm in neutral, I can make my gear stick move around a lot more. Anyway, let's get it started up and have a listen. It's a remarkably quiet example of an A-series, actually. Don't you think that sounds lovely? There's no knocking. No rattling. Glorious, absolutely glorious. Should we take her out for a drive? top speed so let's go on a bit of an adventure because it's a really sunny day and I want you to see this car in action. A lot of people think that older stuff is really slow and sluggish and doesn't have much to give but as you can see here even on this 1100 engine 
it's great it's just gliding along and again that's not just a well-kept engine which is very well looked after as as is the rest of the car you also benefit from that hydroelastic suspension and i wanted to show you it because as we come along these roads and they're filled with dips and potholes and they're just generally in a state of malaise you glide along them like it's nothing's wrong at all and that is the marvel of hydroelastic suspension but did you know that Alec Sagonis wasn't actually that keen on it he was a bit on the fence and he was like mm, I don't know and had to be persuaded over the line a little bit like would you believe disc brakes he thought we were all fine to stay on drums so even though he really was a genius there were some of his ideas which perhaps weren't as spot on as they could or definitely should be now, if you're watching this from outside Britain, I'm going to give you a moderately interesting fact. It's that these, along with minis, were a driving school favourite. And in fact, driving schools up and down the country could be seen taking hopeful youngsters out in these to learn how to drive. So I guess my first thought was, was how easy is it really compared to other vehicles of the time? And let me tell you now, in terms of stuff that I could compare it to, like all the other cars that were out there, Cortina, I would definitely say it's as easy to drive as that. In terms of your visibility, it is really unrivaled. It is just fantastic. I can see every corner. The seat is high enough that I can see to the end of the bonnet. I can see both wings. And there's plenty of space around me, which as I get into it, as a relative stranger to the vehicle, I feel very confident indeed. So I can see why so many people took to these like a duck to water. Now you'll probably notice that I'm setting off in second gear. That's just a bit of a learned habit really from being in the Morris Minor. And the reason for that is, is that I was always taught when I, bought my first Morris Minor, I bought it from the Charles Ware Centre and they said don't be using that first gear unless you are stationary or you're trying to do a bit of a hill start. They always said to me just avoid it because it will end up quite weak and just always set off in second gear where you can. So I've had that kind of bred into me from a really early age so I know someone will ask why I'm doing that. Now if you're looking for a 60s car these are a good bet. Now I want to talk about something because in a recent video I did, I was talking about the Riley Kestrel. Do you remember Phase, which was damaged by the deer? And I was talking about availability of panels. And somebody said to me, Steph, you can get all your panels and you can get everything you need for the ADO 16. But the thing is, is, there were six different variants, I believe. And the way they changed it was, they obviously had different badging, different trim but they also had different front ends so to clarify exactly what I meant I meant that the Kestrel was incredibly rare and it's impossible or nigh on impossible very hard indeed to find the panels that you need for the front end whereas if you go for a more common variant like this or the Morris or the Austin the panels are a lot easier to find but more so than that the most important thing that you need with an old car is club support and these cars have it in spades fantastic club for this David's part of the 1100 club although you've got I think it's ado16.info as well again whichever club you approach friendly bunch of people really great for advice I know that a friend bought one and he was a little bit stuck on how to fix various bits and pieces and the club actually spent time with him not only helping him get the job done but also showing him and for me that makes it an incredible club that is not only investing in the cars of today but the cars of tomorrow as well so a big thumbs up for club support if you're looking for one of these now I did talk about when we were out in the Triumph 1500 that these sadly aren't as cheap as they once were because they are incredibly popular because they are so attractive they're easy to drive the handling is probably some of the best of a 60s vehicle and the prices really reflect that so what kind of price are you looking to pay? Well, this is a bit of a hot topic, really, because I was talking to a couple of people, and David, the owner of this, said, realistically, when you go to look for one, 
you will see them at all sorts of prices, which opens up a realm of possibilities, but also a realm of woe, because if you make the wrong choice, it could go dramatically wrong. Because the reason that there's not a lot of these about in terms of how many were sold, relatively, is that unfortunately, the way that they were designed means that they have quite a propensity for rot so do be careful if you are buying one and if you can spend a little bit more money to get a better example it's probably a good idea unless you're quite canny with a welder so I said to David what would something like this set you back and um, for a really great example like this you probably aren't going to be getting much change from £10,000. Whereas that Triumph 1500 that we saw, you could be getting change from five. So it's one of those things really, isn't it? But as you could probably tell, both of them are really attractive prospects for a mid-century 60s, 70s saloon. And whichever choice you make out of the two that I've recently shown you, they're both just so delightful to drive. This one, I feel, has better suspension. Um, the gear change is nicer. And in many ways, I prefer some of the styling. One of the big styling cues in this is those door cards. And I just think it's so attractive where you've got the lovely monochrome bits and pieces paired up against that pinstripe door card. It just makes for an attractive finish on the car. If I had to pick out the bad points, I would say you have to be incredibly careful because of the rot. But I mean, all the comments will be saying that as well. Um, and apart from that, I really do struggle because I really adore these. I've always wanted one myself, um, but I've just never, ever had the budget to be able to do it. And as they go up in price, I don't think I probably ever will do. So I guess that's mine and negative, really. They're too expensive for me to be able to afford one. Now, I really hope you've enjoyed this video. It's lovely to revisit something that I especially adore, to borrow a car off somebody that I really enjoy spending time with as well, and to give you a little bit more history on British motoring. Hope you've enjoyed the video. Um, we're back next weekend. I think we've got a bit of tinkering and a few other bits and pieces. But until then, take care and drive safely. Thank <laughs> you.